you're on. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the Astro Imaging Channel. We've had a beautiful day here in Southern California. It was bright and clear, a little hot, but beautiful all over the place. Everybody was happy walking around. And now we're going to have Richard tell us about how guiding has to die. And he's not going to be nice about it from what he said. He just says it's got to <laughs> go. So get ready for that, okay? The Grim Reaper is about to announce what's going to happen. Before he does that, however, I want to take you to my entire screen. And I'm going to share that. And here you have some of the people who helped put on the show for you. You can see it there. Uh, come on, screen. Let's get up the speed there. And uh, now I'm going to go to over here where I can call up the calendar. And as you can see, we got lots of cool stuff on the calendar. Today is Richard, the, the guiding killer. And then Peter, Mace Word, Mace Verd, and Philip Mayer, and Francesco Machia, and Andrew Lenderfield are going to be here next week. And they're going to talk about this beautiful project they put together uh, of uh, imaging M106. And it was an art of collaboration and stuff like that. And they did a great job on the on the project. But they're also going to tell us how they're doing it. And, and Francesco is going to talk to us in, in a few in a minute or two here. And then um, we're going to have some other shows coming up for you. We've got 4th of July. We're going to take off. July 3rd, actually, we'll be taking off. Um, Guy Yanez here is talking about imaging for free using um, free software, shareware, and things like that in order to get your job done. And then Bob CEQ is coming in to tell us about being your own master astrophotographer. Um, so there'll be a lot of shows. And you will notice that thanks to Eric's work and a few other people, we have filled up a, a good part of the summer. And um, so we're, we're in pretty good shape for a while. But we still need you to hit the, the contact button and sign up tell us that you want to be part of the astro imaging channel team um you've heard me over and over again say we need more presenters we need more presenters and we need more presenters and we figure that if you're smart enough to do astro imaging you're probably smart enough to tell us a little bit about how you do astro imaging and what we can learn from you share what you've already done but as you might have heard during the anniversary show a couple of weeks ago we are also needing help in uh, helping us to manage our internet contacts, our social media, and things like that in order to grow the channel. We're approaching 13,000 subscribers, and we figure that there are more astroimagers out there that need to hear about us. So if you know anything about um, YouTube, the algorithms for search engines and things like that, please get a hold of us and, and help us out there, okay? So hit the calendar button. I remind you also that um, Rory is collecting uh, images for the um, uh, TAIC workshop. Uh, Eric has put his uh, his file up on um, his data up on the web. You can get that the data right here, and you can uh, process it and submit it. And Rory will get it, and he'll look at it, and he'll figure out what we need to do to put a show together with your program, with your um, work, and other people's work. And TAIC C shots. Arno has been working with this. We're getting lots of good pictures of people giving us examples from the center of the Milky Way. You know, any place within the, what does I say here? 20 degrees of Sagittarius A, you know. Um, so please, A star, I suppose I should say, because that's its proper scientific name. Um, so please participate by sending in your shots of the center of the Milky Way. Um, I wanted to re I wanted to one other thing while we're in calendar land here. I'm going to be gone for a couple of Sundays, not next Sunday. I'll be here for that with Jock. But then the couple of Sundays after that, I'm going to be um, uh, traveling uh, up into the Rocky Mountain Star Stair, among other things. That's the part where you're involved with that. As you know, every uh, time I go to a star party, I uh, put on the the astro imaging rigs of Oki Techs or the Winter Star Party or Nightfall or wherever it is I'm going. And I don't know of anybody who's going to the Rocky Mountain Star Stair to help me out with this project. I usually have to have somebody help me out with it so that we can we can talk and hold the iPhone and do the videoing at the same time. So if you're going to the Rocky Mountain Star Stair, please hit the contact button here. Tell me you're going. We'll hook up somehow or another uh, when we get there, and we'll we'll be able to uh, put the 
the astro imaging rigs of the Rocky Mountain Star Stair. Now, before we go on, I want um, I want uh, 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 Francesco to tell us a little bit about what happened. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Uh, tell us just just enough to get us eager to come back next week and and see what's happening. Okay. Thank you, Alex. So if people come back next week, they are going to hear about uh, a collaborative project that uh, four imagers across two continents under two cluster January. We decided to take uh, the, the deepest image we could of the galaxy 106, M106, and the surrounding field, because one of us, Peter, had found some interesting H-alpha data and uh, wanted to see how far we could take it. And so it's going to be a little bit about, uh, sure, we're going to talk about processing and techniques, but most of all, it's going to be about how to set up a collaboration across uh, nine time zones using uh, similar telescopes and equipment, but from radically different Bortle zones, from Bortle 4 to Bortle 7 or 8, and still come up uh, with, uh, with the 225 hours or 800,000 seconds of usable imaging time to assemble and to process together. Sounds pretty cool, Francesco. And so you guys come back for that, but it's about time to introduce Richard. He's been sitting there. Here he is, the harbinger of death in the future. Uh, Richard, go ahead and take over. All right. I'm going to share my screen, start my slides. We are presenting. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Uh, yes, we can. Okay. All right. Guiding needs to die. And how it's uh, how it's going to happen. So if you don't know um, who I am, I'm Richard. Uh, I've been imaging a while, been working in the vendor community for many years and um, done a lot of done a lot of stuff. And uh, I have uh, formulated uh, an idea of how I think guiding is going to die if it's not already dead and how that's going to happen. Uh, I do work. Um, my main job is doing um, graphics programming. Uh, at a company in Colorado, we do uh, GPU technologies, that, that sort of thing. So you're going to hear a little bit about that. This is going to be about the future. Um, so it's like some of this may not apply right now. Some of it may be very scary right now. But as time passes, uh, this is kind of this is where we're going. We're clearly on the road uh, to the future. Um, and uh, a good bit of what I'm going to talk about is, is possible right now. Uh, without waiting for any new breakthroughs in technology to come along. So the question is, can you do without guiding uh, at all? And every time I talk about this, um, I run into three camps of people. Uh, it, and I have to give credit to Arthur C. Clarke for this. Uh, you know, but when, when a new piece, of, when new technology first comes along, or you say, hey, we're going to be able to do this, uh, it's like, no, that can't be done. It's not possible. And even in the pre-show, people are saying, well, I'll have to guide because uh, this, that, or the other thing. Um, and then there's the, okay, fine, but uh, man, that's just too much effort and cost. I got a little bit of that earlier. Uh, sell my mounts and buy some paramounts. So, you know, if you buy a big expensive mount, that, that that's just not worth it. And then finally, there, when it becomes ubiquitous, uh, everybody's like, well, yeah, I knew that was a good idea. Uh, all along. So thank you, Arthur C. Clarke, uh, for that um, that way of looking at, uh, you know, technologies. Um, so what is guiding? Just let's just talk about guiding for a minute or two first. Uh, guiding is when you use two scopes and two cameras. You have an imaging scope, which is taking your photo of your target, and you have another smaller guide scope uh, along for a ride. This picture um, up here is actually a hideous configuration. I was testing a camera. That is actually a lot of people try to guide that way. It's one of the reasons guiding stinks so bad. Um, but you've got a second scope that finds a star and uh, it tracks that star. So if the mount can't track perfectly, it kind of bumps the mount in the right direction to keep that star centered on a crosshair. Uh, problems with that uh, is you know, the big, the, the guide scope can kind of flex or move differently from the main scope. And so even though you keep the guide star center, uh, that guide star is sort of drifting relative to the main imaging scope. And so there's a limit to how long you can guide. 
uh, on a system like this here, uh, you could probably only guide for a couple of minutes, and then the flexure between the two OTAs is going to start getting in the way. So a lot of people do off-axis guiding. Uh, this is a great solution where you have a little pick-off mirror that goes at the edge of the field. Um, the problem is, well, the benefit is you can guide almost forever uh, with this without getting any sort of flexure between your two uh, optical systems. Uh, the problem is, of course, finding... Um, Somebody's got their mic on. I'm just uh, going to interrupt and say I can hear you shuffling papers and so forth. So just a gentle reminder because I'm sure you probably didn't realize that. But OK, uh, but this, uh, you know, this off axis guider, you can guide forever is what I was saying. But of course, it's hard to find a guide star at the edge of the field. Usually stars at the edge of the field are misshapen and so forth. And so it, it, it has its own challenges. So when you're guiding, you could, you could use, uh, there are a number of programs that will guide. Uh, this is uh, the SkyX, but a lot of people like PhD or, or Nina or whatever. Whatever you like to use, that's fine. They're all doing the same thing. Uh, they find a star and they, they bump the mount. Now, if you've got a really good performing mount and your guiding parameters are set up correctly, uh, you're going to see, like in your RA axis, you'll see a little bit of a sine wave, a little bump up and down. That's the periodic error in your mount. And you can train out the periodic error so that your guiding has to work uh, less easily. Uh, if you're a little bit off of the pole, this uh, top, um, ac uh, top graph is like your declination corrections. Notice the declination corrections are all in the same direction. You shouldn't be bouncing your declination back and forth. Uh, when you're guiding, that's just a free guiding tip. If you're going uh, to guide anyway, uh, you shouldn't be doing it. Um, let's face it, guiding is just a terrible experience. Um, you have to have extra gear. It's really hard because of flexure, overcorrecting. Um, you know, when you're driving down the highway, uh, even if you don't have a very good car and it wants to drift, all you do is kind of give it a little, uh, a little, a little, a little jolt every now and then just kind of feather it in one direction um actually somebody's watching is there a little picture of me in the window or do you just see my slides we put out a, a little picture of you okay good yeah. so you can see me this is what you know when you get a teenager behind the wheel they do this with the wheel trying to keep the car in the middle of the street that's how a lot of people try to guide uh, so there's another free, you know, guiding tip. Doesn't matter what software you're using for, you're using, quit chasing uh, the seeing. Um, so that's, you know, overcorrecting is, is, a, is a constant challenge. Uh, finding a good guide star that's not too faint, but not too bright. And then, of course, if, you're, if you have an equatorial mount and you do the meridian flip, you've got to find a guide star again and automate that. So it's just, it's just a lot of trouble uh, to guide in the first place. So how do we get rid of that? How is that going to go away in the future? Um, it's already starting. The only thing constant is change. So we've seen a lot of things happening in astronomy, uh, incredible changes uh, from eyepieces to photography. It's funny, um, I was reading about the history of uh, astronomy, and when they first started using glass plates, the, uh, the astronomers were would make fun of the photographers because only the human eye on an eyepiece was... That was how you did real science, not with photography. And now, of course, today, nobody uses, uh, you know, if you're doing real science, uh, so to speak, you're, you're, you don't do very much with the eyepiece. Uh, we've gone from did, uh, developing film in a dark room and learning all the techniques and workshops about how to hyper your film and how to get do all of that uh, to uh, the digital age. Uh, I remember using, this is uh, actually a photo, I still have my original Philips webcam. Uh, that I that I hijacked many many years ago to turn into a, a planetary imaging, and I've been around just long enough uh, to hear stories and know that uh, you know when when uh, my old alma mater software BISC when they first started introducing uh, the sky and imaging software using a laptop next to the scope they were laughed at uh, they, they were ridiculed nobody's going to use a laptop next to their telescope. And of course, now everybody's got their laptop and they don't want to give it up, uh, or some people do, but we're already seeing the, you know, the, 
the, the, the end of that. And this pattern is not going to stop. Uh, things are just going to keep moving forward and, and change. And a lot of people don't want to change because this is how I do it. I'm getting good results and I'm comfortable with it. And, and, that's, and that's fine. But the technology does, uh, does move forward. So <clears throat> let's, let's get the white elephant out of the room, the CMOS versus CCD uh, debate. I was on the, the Astro Imaging channel a couple of years back talking about the transition from uh, CCD to CMOS. Well, that's over. Uh, it, it, it's over. Um, C CMOS is winning. And, and I was like, well, it's catching up, but it's not quite there yet. It's there yet. Uh, and I'm not, and sure, you can find some crappy CMOS camera and compare it to some really good CCD camera and go, look, this CCD is better. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about what's the latest, greatest CCD you know, that you can afford and what's the latest, greatest CMOS that you can afford. And the, the CCD market is drying up. The manufacturers aren't even making them anymore uh, for our market. There are still some CCDs. They do still have some, there are places where CCD wins over CMOS, like in orbit. Uh, when you have uh, CCD is much more uh, robust uh, in a uh, you know a space environment where you're going to have cosmic ray hits and things like that than CMOS is, but you're not in orbit. You're in your backyard or you're at an observatory someplace, um, and and in that case, uh, CMOS, the current generation of CMOS, uh, is winning. QE is approaching 100%. It's not there yet. Uh, but it gets better and better and better. Who remembers when you know CCDs had 30% quantum efficiency, and uh, you know, and then it's like, ooh, 70%. Now we're pushing into the 80s. Every generation of CMOS that comes out is is and, and back illuminated won't even be a buzzword anymore. It'll be like, well, who doesn't do back illuminated? It's you know, whatever. I mean, why would you not build it that way? Uh, and so the, the QE is going to approach, it's not going to be 100% ever, but it's going to get very close to that. Read noise is also approaching uh, zero. Uh, it's gone down quite a bit. Uh, you know, it's not zero yet, uh, and it may never be actually zero, but it, every new generation of CMOS that comes out, that read noise goes down, and that's going to keep happening. Uh, you have to remember that the market for these cameras is enormous. Astronomy is like spinning into the ocean. Uh, the the market for security cameras and uh, and 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 home security cameras and satellite, I mean, um, traffic light uh, cameras and cell phone cameras, all of that, all of that industry. We're talking hundreds of billions of dollars uh, that is pushing this technology forward, and we're reaping the benefits of it because those cameras also need to perform well in low light situations and they need to not have lots of noise in them so that we can pull things out uh you know if you get a blurry grainy image of some guy hijacking a car or breaking into a bank you know the only way to get that image to process really well is to get cleaner and cleaner data uh cmos for a while wasn't very linear uh, the newest chips are very are very linear. Amp Glow is gone. In fact, it wasn't even Amp Glow. Amp Glow was a, from CCD days. With a CMOS, every pixel has its own amplifier. It's just the the electronics around the CMOS kit sensor uh, were, of course, uh, warm and in, in radiating infrared radiation. But that's well controlled now as well, and almost uh, completely gone. This was one of the things that I I was a real stickler for. CMOS isn't quite there yet. Uh, because, well, our sensor has no amp glow. The first couple of CMOS kit sensors that came out where the manufacturer insisted there was no amp glow, I could always find a little bit of amp glow. Um, and I can't anymore. Uh, we're pretty good. Uh, CMOS used to have very shallow, full well depth. Um, also, the last really bad thing about CMOS uh, was pattern noise. And I'll talk more about dark pattern noise in a minute because it's very important uh, for where, why we can get rid of guiding uh, down the road. Cameras aren't the only thing that's evolving, though. Uh, you know, at the same time, we're seeing fast glass come along. Computers are getting better. Computer models uh, can be used to design new glass. Material science is coming out with new uh, glass materials. Uh, Astrophysics, uh, you know, announced their latest scope that's coming out, and they're using a new... Uh, type of glass because it behaves as good as the really expensive glass 
but it's a new synthetic type of glass. This just keeps happening. Again, it's not the astronomy industry necessarily that's pushing this forward, but we get to take advantage of that. Uh, and, you know, when we talk about the future, you know, if you've been doing this for more than three or four years, you know that an F4 lens on a tripod shooting the Milky Way is really luxurious today. Uh, I can, in eight or 10 seconds, I can get a beautiful Milky Way shot on my DSLR. And, you know, I spent less than a thousand dollars for that lens. And that technology 10, 15, 20 years ago would, would have been prohibitively uh, expensive. Um, Newtonians are, are like F4 now. Uh, it's very, uh, it's very common uh, to we're, ba we're basically seeing uh, refractors and telescopes getting uh, much faster. This is my uh, this is my uh, Riccardi Honders here at a, at a star party. I don't remember which one. And I bought this um, a very long time ago, maybe 15 years ago, uh, which isn't that long. And I tell you what, this was a great purchase because uh, I was the cool teenager with the hot rod. Uh, I had the coolest, uh, you know, telescope on the, you know, on the campsite. It's like, oh, yeah, come and look at my sexy beast of a Riccardi Honda's F3. Ooh, very nice. But, you know, F, you, I've got other scopes that shoot F3 now. I've got a, a reducer for my Newtonian. You can get reducers for refractors to shoot F3. F2 scopes are essentially a commodity. So the optics are getting better. The cameras are getting better, okay? So now what? What 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 happens next? Where do we go from here? When the optics are just stupid fast and cameras can't get any better, because let's face it, once you get cameras can't get a whole lot better than they are now. They can, but you can't get more than 100% quantum efficiency. And you know, I know about those photo multipliers and all of that. It's all a magic trick to make things brighter and above the noise. But there's only so much light coming from the Andromeda galaxy, and you can only detect a certain percentage of that. You can't detect more than 100% of the light coming in. Uh, and the read noise is getting, you know, is getting lower and lower. What happens when cameras are almost a perfect camera uh, and don't have any noise? The process, you know, uh, that we're doing now, how do we improve it? Well, better guiding so that I can go longer. Let's get rid of periodic error with, with absolute encoders and the prices on encoders are going down. Uh, we can do fancy mount modeling. You can run your, your T-point or other, other competing uh, models to kind of model where things are going. There's no more room to improve the process. If you've got enough money, you can buy a really great camera and a really great mount and you can pretty much everything is perfect. But what do you, where do you go from there? I mean, really, where do you go from there? Well, it's time to change the process of how we do imaging. Once we can't really make any improvements, it's time to rethink how we're imaging. Um, and I and I believe that 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 uh, I believe we're at that stage where uh, astrophotography is about to change in some in some very big ways. So your next buzzword is computational photography. Uh, you're very welcome. Uh, this will probably be making the rounds. People will be talking about this. Maybe, maybe not. What is computational photography? It's basically computer-assisted photography. Uh, that's where the computer takes, the computer is in the camera and makes adjustments for how you take the photos, and it does it on the fly. This isn't post-processing. This isn't hours with pics and sight and taking workshops uh, you know, on how to do it. And you're already using computational photography. You don't even know it. If your camera is doing autofocus, arguably autofocus is uh, computational photography. The color balance. Um, it always amuse, amuses me when people say photography contests shouldn't be about processing. It should be what comes out of the camera. What comes out of the camera is awful. Um, if you could see like the, the engineering the engineering image that comes even out of a modern uh, mirrorless camera or off your cell phone before they do any processing to the raw sensor data, it's horrible looking. Somebody has to process that data. And more and more, the computer is doing that processing for you. Back in the film days, I used to take my film to a photo processing place and a technician would process the film. He would develop it 
a machine would do a lot of it, but they'd always look at it and make some minor adjustments. And that's all photographers do today when they bring things into Photoshop. If you've ever taken a, a panorama with your iPhone or your Android, think about what's actually going on with that. It's taking several, many images as you move, maybe a video feed, and live, real time, while you're watching, it's stitching that image together into a panorama. And we're like, ooh, I use ice or I use this to do my mosaics. Dudes, on your phone, it's doing a mosaic while you watch, okay? Uh, high dynamic range uh, imaging uh, is another application of computational photography where it'll take a dim image and a dark image or maybe three or four images all changing the exposure and then combining them into one image with a much greater dynamic range that you could have gotten with a single uh, exposure. Same thing goes for focus stacking. If, if you've ever seen that, people doing insects, for example, uh, with macros, you can't, you can only get the eyeball in focus. Everything else is out of focus. So you'll change the focus and the computer will stitch together the images so that the whole image is in focus. And you may take five or six images and all at different focus settings and then to combine the sharpest part of those and it can do it while you watch. All right. I mean, it's happening real time while you're watching it happen on your phone or on your uh, DSLR or point and shoot camera. How is it doing that? Here's your next uh, buzzword graphics processing unit. You've probably heard of a CPU. That's the heart of your computer, the central processing unit. That's what moves memory, multiplies numbers together. Uh, it, it's, it's basically the heart of any modern computer is a CPU, the central processing unit. Something new uh, named uh, around 1999 is called the GPU. It's called the graphics processing unit. It's the same as a CPU, but it's entirely graphics oriented. And it's very parallel. Um, and what that means is like, if you have a, a, a fast computer, you probably have a multi-core CPU. Uh, you might spend a lot of money if you're doing picks in sight. Oh, I want the eight core computer so I can have eight cores working on my image at a time. And, and okay, that's great. You got eight, eight CPUs that can work on your image. Um, and the GPU world is just like, isn't that cute? Uh, the, latest, uh, the, the latest graphics card that does computer game processing has over 4,000 uh, processing units for uh, processing pixels. You can literally have one processor per pixel on your screen when you're using a GPU to do the computations. Okay, and GPUs are everywhere. Um, no, here's some, here's some pictures. Uh, this is an Arsenal 2. It's an add-on for your DSLR or your SLR, uh, you know, and it's got a GPU embedded in it. And it does smart things like the focus stacking uh, that I was talking about. So you can buy a GPU and add it to your existing camera, uh, and it'll do some smart things for you to help you take photos uh, much, uh, much easier. Uh, the ASI Air, it's uh, based on Raspberry Pi hardware. Now, I don't think ZWO is actually making use of it, but there is a GPU in that little box that they could make use of and could very much accelerate if they were doing any graphical processing right inside that box. And that's perfectly, um, perfectly plausible with, with today's hardware. This is not really new either. 10 years ago, uh, I presented at the Apple uh, Worldwide Developers Conference. Apple added some GPU technologies to their operating system. And I animated the entire Minor Planet Center catalog uh, using GPU te technologies, computed the orbits of over half a million um, minor planets. And it, not just the drawing of them, but calculating where the asteroids were. I did all of that on the GPU. And that was over 10 years ago. And of course, it was, it, nobody could do it real time at that time, just using CPUs. And we even showed, here's an eight core Super Monster Mac. And it was like, whippy, whippy, whippy. And it said, let's let the GPU do it. And it was like, awesome, phenomenal cosmic powers. Uh, the GPU can do all of that, uh, you know, very, very, very well. Okay, so that's great. Thanks for the technology talk, Richard. What's this have to do with astrophotography? Well, this stuff can be applied and 
it people are already figuring this out not me uh, and it's starting to work its way into products and it will be working its way into products over the next few years and it's going to be uh, something of a revolution you've probably seen live stacking before uh, live stacking is already here uh, most smartphones do live stacking uh, I love to walk around it and take my night walk at Christmas or Halloween and hold my phone up and I'll take a picture of somebody's yard decoration and I'll just hold the phone still and I go for like five seconds and it's taken you know like 20 sh really short images and stacked them all and aligned them while I sit there and watch the phone and I get a beautiful image on my phone why the he double toothpicks is that does astronomy software so far behind the curve if i can do that on my phone what's what's the hold up and it's just time and software developers you know working in this uh working in this industry uh the attic infinity uh you know they came out with a camera that did live stacking i don't need to i don't mean to to belittle that but it wasn't the camera it was the software they shipped with the camera any camera can do live stacking you just need software to pull off images and align them and stack them for you uh while you go uh, i wrote this myself uh the algorithm in the sky x that does uh, live stacking sharp cap does live stacking Malincom has some program software that does live stacking you just find the stars and you adjust the image and you like line it up just like pixinsight does except you do it on the fly every time an image comes down you align it and you add it to the stack while you go uh, the Malincamp crowd um, I imagine they're very irritable when we act like we invented uh, you know electronic observing because they've been doing this for years and I think you know they're um, uh, you know the way they like to observe just go around to an object and get an image I think that's about to experience a renaissance and it's about to get uh, much much easier we're seeing some products already on the market that are doing live stacking uh, Unistellar uh, the Stellina, where they're building a product, and I mean, they're presenting it as an observing experience. But make no mistake, they're live stacking on their. They've got a computer in there, and they're live stacking that image for you to look at and go, "Wow, there's a galaxy," and that's really cool. Uh, you know, now a lot of the imagers watching this is like, "Well, I don't want you know, I, my my images are going to look, you know, it's not good enough for them," and that's fine. I mean, you're not, I don't expect a wedding photographer to, you know, use a, an iPhone, you know, for their wedding photographs either. But that's where we are right now. Uh, with time, you know, who knows? What's crude and expensive today? Here's a shot from their website. I think it's the Stellina uh, website. You know, it, okay, that's a pretty decent, I'll tell you what, I'd have killed to get an image like that, you know, 15 years ago. Uh, and here's a nice image that I processed by hand. But I'm telling you that, maybe within five to ten years you're gonna get you're gonna get images like this out of these systems that live stack and process the data on the fly while you're going Arthur, another great quote from arthur c clark any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic and modern cameras and telescopes are already getting uh pretty magical now this is not just about how gpus are going to do some image processing magic you're going to have some machine learning thing that, that looks at a blurry uh you know galaxy and can make a pretty image out of the galaxy we're talking about processing the real data and we do this now either the long way or long or with live stacking by of course stacking and stacking is when you take a lot of these noisy images on the left here and you align them and you stack them to get this nice, you know, clean image on the right. And everybody's seen this chart. I hate this chart. I've got a better chart to show you in a minute. Uh, we've all seen this graph. I think this is a terrible graph because this shows how the signal to noise ratio goes down. And usually it's explained like this. Uh, you know, once you get to about 12 or 16 exposures, the signal to noise ratio doesn't improve. And people think they should stop at 16 or, or 12 exposures, and, and that's it. Here's the problem. This relationship has nothing to do with the number of exposures, maybe tangentially. It has something to do with the number of exposures. Um, but really, it's about the physics of light. It's about the signal. It's not about 
how long you've exposed. Although exposing longer does get more signal, you have to detach yourself from that and realize it's the signal. This image right here, it's not just a pretty image behind the graph. There's dark areas here and there's bright areas here. And to get a nice clean image of the bright areas, you don't need to expose very long at all. If you wanna get a nice clean image of the dark areas, you're gonna to have to expose a long time to get that signal high enough that the signal to noise ratio um, uh, you know, is gonna matter. Uh, a, another good way to break the psychic or the, you know, the psychological hold on this is are these two minute exposures or 10 minute exposures or one hour exposures? You know, after 12 exposures, well, I guarantee you 12 five minute exposures is gonna look a lot better than 12 one minute exposures. There's no diminishing returns after 12 one minute exposures. You're gonna see a big improvement by taking much more, uh, you know, much more data on your target. And things have changed. Read noise has plummeted on cameras. Um, you know, often we're down to an electron or less uh, with, with CBOS cameras. Uh, you know, uh, the ST9E was 13 electrons. Uh, you know, even the Trius, this is probably the 694. The Sony 694, I think, is the last great CCD uh, chip. I, I would not, uh, I wouldn't think twice about buying that uh, or um, hanging on to it if you have one, other than the chip is very small. But the reading noise is pretty small on that. And the Q is very high. But look at these, you know, electron, um, these numbers here. I'm pointing at the wrong screen. Uh, you know, there's a lot of read noise in terms of electronic. Uh, noise that's coming in. And the limit, I'm going to go back to this, the limit to how short these exposures can be. I mean, really, if it does matter if they're longer exposures, because it's all about the signal. Well, how short can the exposures be? If I take 10 hours of one second exposures, is it the same as one 10 hour exposure? It depends. What does it depend on? It depends on the noise from the camera. And the noise on the camera is much, much less than the noise on the camera used to be. Guiding needs to die. That's my quote. You can put that on my tombstone. Guiding needs to die. So here's a better, um, a better graph that I like to show. Uh, the signal is going up linearly as you as you collect more light in a bright area. The signal goes up. The noise goes up much slower. And you can see down here at the lower left the noise is actually greater than the signal. And when you're down there where the noise is greater than the signal, you're not, you, you're not gonna get any good results by stacking. Uh, you, need, you need to get somewhere where the signal is well above the noise from the camera uh, for that to work. And this is actually mostly shot noise, but we don't have time to go into that. So basically what I'm saying is uh, the limit to how short exposures can be is how clean the camera data is. How low is the read noise? Now, it's not just the read noise though, it's also the dark pattern noise. And dark pattern noise in a CCD, we would calibrate out. That's why you took darks or biases. You don't do darks and biases, by the way, unless you're scaling your darks, and that's also another uh, rabbit hole. But uh, there's a pattern in the image, even if you don't collect any light, and that intrudes on low signal levels, and getting rid of that is very difficult. It's very difficult to calibrate out uh, on early CMOSs. In fact, when CMOS finally started getting really kind of competitive, you know, the camera manufacturers like to talk about how low the read noise was. And I was definitely a sticker. It was a stickler on that too. It's like, I'd still rather have my CCD. The read noise on the CMOS is so low. Yeah, but the pattern noise is awful. Uh, the dark pattern noise was just awful. And it would move around, uh, especially on the lower cost CMOS cameras, that you would get these banding things that would just dance around from image to image, and they don't calibrate out. And so that, you know, not just the read noise, but that dark pattern noise was a huge hindrance to being able to stack lots of very, very short exposures. But the latest CMOS cameras, the pattern noise is very well controlled. In fact, it's very, very low way down there in the read noise area. If you have one of the, like the 455, um, you know, the IMX 455 sensors and you shot with mono with one of those and you look at the darks or the biases, that's a very clean image. Uh, and there's no pa dark pattern noise dancing around in those things. Uh, and of course the read noise can also be, uh, can be very low. So 
what I'm saying is already you could probably get away with very short exposures. And I have some examples later. Uh, you know, I, I got to a point, yeah, I had a paramount. People's like, oh, Richard's got a paramount. He knows how to use it, so he never guides. You know what I would do at a star party or when I would go down to my dark sky camp? Uh, I'd set it up and I'd futz with it, but I'd only futz with it for so long. I can't go more than three minutes. I don't know what's wrong. And there's two types of people. There's the people that will spend the rest of the night trying to figure out why they can't go more than three minutes. And there's the people like me who will go, okay, I guess I'm shooting three minutes and I'll shoot all night at three minutes. And I'll stack that data and I will get great data. And instead of arguing with my mount all night long and finding out it's a stuck cable or I need to grease it or whatever the reason is, I've got some good data and I just took more shorter exposures. Now, there are some obvious drawbacks to short exposures. Um, you know, the, the re electronic read noises go away. When that happens, you know, I would say in the next five years, the next couple of generations of CMOS, there's going to be almost no practical limit to how short exposures can become. Well, what are you going to do when that happens? Uh, because you've got to have a lot of storage for all of that data, and you've got to have a lot of computer horsepower. Uh, to keep up with that. And so one of two things is going to happen. Computers, of course, are getting faster. But I think that there's a missing opportunity with live stacking and computational photography. And I've talked to some of my peers, and I'm not going to give away, but other people are working on this. Uh, and you can see in the products that are out now that people are working on this and, on, and, uh, and, and evolving towards this. Uh, you're, we're going to get to a point where you can calibrate the images, short images, as you take them, combine them, and then write them to an image store. And you don't have to save every single 15-second exposure. Just every five minutes or so, save out which ones you have. Oh, an airplane flew through. You know, computational photography. Oh, here's a picture with a big airplane coming through it. I'm going to throw that one away. Now, instead of losing a five-minute exposure, I've lost a 20-second exposure. Or somebody bumps them out, or a raccoon, you know, attacks it, or a truck drives by. I have that happen uh, at my house. Guiding problems, uh, a lot of times, or, you know, a bad sub, a lot of times it's just nothing but a truck coming by or the central air coming on. Uh, and so you can throw away the bad data as it comes. You're going to get sharper, better quality data by looking at the data as it's coming off the camera at a much more frequent, uh, at a much more frequent cadence, uh, there's also duty cycle to to uh, to bear in mind. I was doing some experiments myself, comparing CMOS to CCD. Uh, well, a great CMOS to what I thought was a still pretty good CCD, and um, the problem was I could download uh, a very short image with my CMOS camera. You know, boom, I downloaded the image. It took eight seconds to download an image off of my CCD camera. Well, if you're doing eight-second exposures, that means if you expose for an hour, you've only got half an hour worth of data. Whereas with the CMOS camera, downloading very quickly, you know, I may have 57 minutes worth of data. And, you know, that's that's a much better, uh, a much better um you know, scenario to find yourself in. So uh, that's that's something we have to, to to worry about. But that fine, you know, get a fast camera. Cameras are getting faster. That problem is also going to go away. So what am I doing here? I'm telling you that the hangups to doing short exposures, you know, the the crit the criticism to doing short exposures. Uh, all of the reasons people give me for why they can't do short exposures have either already gone away and they don't realize it, or they're going to go away in the next five years. And when that happens, who the heck uh, is going to guide anymore? Uh, you're not going to need to guide, and you're not going to need a $10,000 mount that can go for a long time unguided uh, as well. Um, that, you know, that, that day is coming. Um, you know, just to, again, we're talking about the future, you know, not next month and not next Christmas. Um, but, you know, I've been doing this for a while. You've a lot of you've been doing this for a while. My first hard drive was a 20 megabyte hard drive. One photo from my uh, Canon DSLR uh, would not fit on that hard drive. Uh, that's how far my laptop has eight terabytes of storage in it. Yeah, it's expensive. 
But I remember my first laptop had, you know, 256 megabytes, you know, of storage in it. And I remember I was an engineer at Lockheed Martin and, and I got a laptop and I remember, and this was, I was doing astrophotography at the time already. Uh, and I remember saying, well, you know, laptops are pretty cool, but it's never going to replace a desktop. I'm never going to want to work on my laptop. I, I need a desktop because I need that extra power. I can't say that anymore. And I'm a pretty spoiled software engineer, uh, you know, doing some highly technical things. And I have a desktop and I have a laptop and I can work as efficiently or better on my laptop than I can on my desktop. Or, or uh, even, even a little Mac uh, Mini M1. I do a lot of work on that. And that's my, uh, one of my main build machines with a big display on it. And I can get real work done on very small computers. So computers are getting smaller. They're getting faster. They got much more memory. And they're getting cheaper as time goes by. We all know, uh, does anybody remember when calculators were like $100 for a four-function calculator? And, and now it's like it's a free app on your on your freaking phone and these things we lose track of how quickly all of these things happen but they do happen rather quickly in the space of just a few years things change very very quickly and the prices come down um very quickly what was used to be really expensive and horribly complicated is cheap and fits in your pocket uh in in no time at all now uh, you can already do this uh, to some degree. Here's some sample shots. Here's a 30 second exposure with um, with a with a with a my Canon EOS RA uh, on a Galaxy, and that looks terrible. You're like, I need to guide. That's an awful image. There's not nearly enough detail in that Galaxy. But you know what? If you take 290 of them, uh, it comes out pretty good seeing could have been a little better and i could have spent a little more time on it it was two and a half hours at oh shoot what was it f7 let's call it f it may have been f6 uh but at f6 so two and a half hours at f6 uh nothing but 30 second exposures um i put on a ccd cam uh, not a ccd um a CMOS camera, uh, the IMX 450, that no, wasn't the 455, it was the little one, the 2600. Monochrome, put a luminance filter on it. Uh, nobody in their right mind would shoot, you know, the, a galaxy with 30 second luminance images. I did, 323 of them. Uh, actually, more than that, I threw a bunch of them away because they weren't very good. I stacked only the good ones. You still need three hours worth of data. Uh, and that hasn't changed. Remember that graph isn't about the number of exposures. It's about the amount of signal that you're getting from the object. Okay, uh, and, Richard, yeah. did, there aren't any questions that are uh, stacking up on the, on YouTube, no pun intended. Mm -hmm. But on something like this, now was this a CMOS where you had 323 individual frames that you had to align the old fashioned way? Yes. And how much data was in those? Uh, they were, it was a, it was, a, it was a crop sensor. I don't remember the size. Okay. And I'm not saying, okay, so this is what I'm demonstrating here is that you can do short exposures and get good data. So if you have, so my question is really leading up to the fact. So hypothetically in a year or two years or three years and we're live stacking then now your 323 30 second exposures come out to 30. yes live stack yes yes exposures. all this is is software the hardware already is capable of doing this all we need is software to do this because this picture demonstrates this demonstrates that even a modern slr camera can do it uh this demonstrates that a modern cmos sensor can do it all right now this is my favorite example this was um, 30 second subs at f4 so you know the optic also plays a role how fast is your glass and listen the 8300 is a terrible chip uh that's a that's a really awful chip by today's standards lots of read noise but i bend two by two and when you bend uh, a CCD, you get a big read noise boost. You don't get that with CMOS, uh, but you get a big read noise boost when you bend a CCD. So I had 
this is not a state-of-the-art CCD image. Um, I mean, the CCD camera. But I bend, I shot at f4, and I took 30-second exposures. And I had a big Newtonian on the mount, and I couldn't shoot. And then we were having a contest, an imaging contest. And the big old, it was like a giant garbage can on the mount. It had all this flexure, and I didn't have an off-axis guider. And the, the mount modeling wasn't working. And it was like, I can only go 30 seconds. I'm doomed. And uh, so it's just like, well, let's just take 30 seconds, bend, and see what happens. And I won the contest. And this is a beautiful image, one of my favorite images. 30 second subs, not even on a great sensor, but the focal ratio matters. If you're shooting at F4 or F3, uh, you probably don't need uh, necessarily a brand new hot and shot CMOS camera. You can probably do this with the camera that you already have, unless you got, you know, an ST9 or something, uh, something really old. So, Richard. Which, yes. can, I, I'm kind of stuck on this live stacking. I see over in the commentary, uh, mm -hmm. one of our own Molly said that there is already live stacking plugins for yes. some of the software. Yes. Is, is that something you can you know tell us about? Uh, something we could do now. Yes, you can do this now. So the Sky X will do live stacking. Uh, Sharp Cap does live stacking. Attic makes software that does live stacking. Malincam does live stacking. That's four off the top of my head, software that does live stacking. And you could live stack. One, one of the things I do in the sky is I'll live stack for five minutes and then save the image. And then live stack for another five minutes and save the, save the image. And I think that is the next breakthrough in the software is where you get rid of all the individual images. And, you, and that way you don't have, you know, 10, uh, you know, uh, 20 gigabytes worth of data that you have to process. So Lee Van Cleef said that there's a live stacking plugin for Nina. Have you? I have not. That? I have not. I, so I, so I, the question would be, is the live stacking when it comes to pass and all of our software, will that be as good as the alignment procedures that we have in Pix Insight? It depends on the software developers. I'm telling you, the the, pick, the alignment stuff in Pix and Site can be made to run real time while you're taking short images. All we need is the software developers to do it. And yes, I'm a software developer, but I don't do this full time anymore. Uh, but the software, the software, yes, yes, you will get mm -hmm. as good. You will be able to get as good results in your alignment as you do today with Pix and Site on the fly. And Marcia said the yeah. ASI Air will do live stacking too. Oh, great, great. Great. So, so that's something we can almost do now. Almost. Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, uh, right. I have what might be a dumb question. Right on this is like from a signal to noise standpoint is like because I usually just stack all my images at once. Um, is it the same to like do sub stacks and then stack it together from a signal to noise standpoint? Uh, so here, there's a couple of caveats to that. So I would say yes, but. Uh, the but is you have to calibrate them on the fly. You can't do your flats and darks on a stacked set of images. Yeah. You have to do your flats and darks as you go. So in the sky, for example, the live stack in the sky, you can take your darks um, or biases, depending on your camera, and you can do your flats ahead of time, and then it will calibrate them uh, as it downloads them off the camera. Uh, so if you're going to have five minutes worth of 10 second exposures you've got to make sure you calibrate those images as you download them um or or clean them up somehow usually to yeah. get rid of like, sharp cap stuff. also does does the live uh dark and flat frame corrections yeah yeah so you can't stack you can but you're not going to get great results if you try to stack a five minute stack with a 10 minute stack with a 20 minute stack so what you're going to want is you're going to want to have five minutes of exposure plus another five minutes of exposure plus another five minutes of exposure, and you're going to want to combine those um, all together. Um, right now, the software is not out. The hardware can do it. What I just do, because, of course, I have Uber computers, is I just, you know, fine, I've got 700 images to stack in a line. Um, and not to give an, a, an advertisement for Apple, but if you buy the latest Mac, 
Pro laptop with lots of memory, it actually does that really fast. Um, you know, and yeah, it's a lot of money, but um, you know, the latest Alienware will be able to do that in a couple of years, probably for even less. In a you know, uh, the price on that just keeps going, you know, going down. Um, more free advice: lots of RAM makes a bigger difference than than clock speed on your CPUs. So get lots of uh, lots of RAM when you're when you're doing that. So the future. Uh, what what is the future? Um, the future of image of astrophotography is the marriage of live stacking and computational photography. We already know that today's cameras are actually capable of doing it. Tomorrow's cameras are going to be able to do it even better with even shorter exposures. I'm not sure I would try three second exposures uh, with a modern CMOS camera, uh, but I'm getting great results with 30 seconds or you know however long however long I can go. Um, the cameras are getting faster, uh, read noise is plummeting, QE is going to be, you know, really great. And when that happens, there's not going to be any need to guide. You're not going to need to be able to guide. Uh, it doesn't matter what your periodic error is. Um, I'm taking a mount to the Grand Canyon Star Party uh, that has like 20 arc seconds of periodic error. Um, I'm not going to talk about a lot of details about it, but it's spread over seven minutes. And if I'm doing 30 second exposures, I'm, it's not going to it's not going to matter what the periodic error is <coughs> on that mount. Uh, computers are getting faster. What you can do on a phone or on a Raspberry Pi, or you know, everybody talks about the Raspberry Pi. You know, the the ASI Air. I've got my own Raspberry Pis, and I've been doing that for close to 10 years. There's like 50 or 60 of those little tiny computers that people can buy and embed into imaging products. Uh, so, you know, that's that's coming. And storage is, of course, getting cheaper uh, and, and cheaper and cheaper. So that's, you know, that's the thing. I, I was going through some old boxes uh, the other day and I found a, a 65 kilobyte jump drive. It was just like, maybe it was 64 megabytes or something but it's just like isn't that cute there's nothing i have today that would fit on this jump drive um but that's that's going to change and of course clever software and machine learning and ai is going to you know make it possible to do things like uh you know um just take 30 second exposures grade them on the fly and in fact i'm going to be so bold and i'm even going to admit that i'm, I'm kind of working on, on this in my spare time Lucky imaging for planets. Um, I, you know, if you're shooting 100, 120 frames per second uh, with a small sensor on the on Jupiter or whatever or the Moon, um, I'm going to tell you right now, with a modern computer and a GPU, you can grade those images on the fly. Somebody made a program where you take your your SIR or AVI file and it pulls out all the all the bad frames and it makes a much smaller image file. And I don't care if somebody else steals the idea. I just don't want somebody to patent it. Uh, because somebody needs to do it, and I don't have time to do it. But a modern computer using the GPU can grade those images on the fly and tell which ones are good and bad and only save the good ones. And now you've got, you know, your 800 or your 8,000 frames that are really good, and that's the only thing in the video file when you go to stack it in AutoStacker and so forth. And, and that's the marriage of live stacking and computational photography is – that next thing that we're going to do that is um you know cameras can't get any better optics are stupid fast what's ne what are we going to do just what we're doing now no we're going to have to it's we're going to have to change uh the process and so that's sort of that's the future of astrophotography and guiding will be gone and dead no, but nobody's going to guide anymore uh when that happens now that's the future what about the mostly now uh, I would say most scopes, if you're doing one-shot color or LRGB, you probably don't need to guide. Guiding was invented when we were taking photos on glass plates, okay? We've come a long way since then. And you saw the, the images that I was showing you. Um, you are getting enough light, unless you're shooting at a really slow focal ratio. But I mean, if you're shooting at F5 or F7, even at F7, when I shoot at F7, I still find I don't need to go very long. Uh, I, some of my best galaxy images are two minutes at F7 
Um, just because I was doing something else and it's just like, hey, well, let's just take a bunch of them shorter and see how they work. And and they come out, they come out great. I haven't guided in years and it's not because I have a $30,000 mount that can do it. It's because I just quit guiding and I take shorter exposures and and it works. Um, it, de it does depend on your focal ratio, as I was saying. I, I'm not sure I would try this at F15, uh, but unless, you know, you're shooting planets or the moon or something. Uh, and HA narrowband, you probably don't for narrowband. Uh, again, depends on your focal ratio. Um, uh, I've done, uh, I did 30 second narrowband images with um, an engineering grade sample CMOS, and I won't go into detail what it is. Uh, it's on the market, but it's very expensive. But I was doing 30 second HAs uh, at F7, and they're just as beautiful as anything I used to take with my F3 Veloce uh, and a CCD and a CCD camera. Um, a lot of objects are really strong in HA. Now, O3 and sulfur, um, you know, there's not a lot of targets that have sulfur in them, much sulfur in them to begin with. Um, there's some really bright O3 targets, uh, but it's not quite as plentiful as HA for most targets. So I would say, you know, rule of thumb, your mileage may vary. Uh, you probably don't need to guide with one shot color or LRGB now, and you probably can get away with no uh, guiding, even for narrow band, if you have a fast enough focal ratio. I had, I've had a Hyperstar, and I've had a Rasa. I got rid of both. My my only beef with Rasa and Hyperstar was uh, the lack of flexibility for the cameras that I wanted to use and uh, camera tilt and things like that. They're fine scopes. But at F2, you don't have to guide for anything, period, end of story. Even if you're doing sulfur and O3 or, or, or narrow band. If you're shooting at F2, and I would dare say even at F3, you don't need to guide. Uh, and let, again, unless you have a really old camera with a lot of read or pattern noise uh, in it that's, that's going to be causing that. Um, and so again, uh, in time, nobody is going to be guiding uh, anymore. Uh, it will be a thing of the past. And it's a thing of the past for me. I, um, of course, I haven't taken any narrowband stuff lately. Uh, but if I do, I might guide. Um, I'm doing a, a review for something for Sky and Tell. And it has guider capabilities. And I have to guide so that I can write in the review that it does guide when you want to use it. But it's a, why? Why do you want to guide? I, you don't, I, I don't need to guide unless I'm doing narrowband on a slow optic. Uh, I just I just don't need to. And and that even goes for the last couple of generate. Well, the last generation of CCD, I don't think you need to guide either. But there's something psychological. You want to see, you know, I got one sub and there's just not much there. And it's hard to convince yourself that you can really combine a lot of images and get just as good an image. And so I would invite, I would advise everybody who's watching this, try it. Try it one night. Yeah, you might have 300 images. And that that's a valid hang up. I understand 300 images is a lot. Uh, you know, not everybody, you know, has a, a, you know, a, a cushy job that provides them with the latest, greatest hardware. And so, you know, if you don't have a really great uh, top end computer, the idea of stacking seven or 800 images is, is sort of mind numbing. Um, but if you can try it, uh, you might be surprised by the results. Um, I guess my point is, the hardware can do it. Um, we just need the software uh, to uh, to catch up uh, in that. And you know, if you if you're willing to put a little work into yourself, you can make it work with modern uh, live stacking software, or just take a whole bunch of short images, calibrate them all, um, and then and then toss them. Another nice thing again about the short images, um, you know, if you get a bad one, you didn't lose a whole five minute sub. You only lost a thirty second sub. Uh, so, you know, go through and grade them all. Again, it takes time to go through and grade by hand, but all that will be automated uh, at some point in the near future. I know uh, I'm working on it in my spare time, and I know there are other people working on it. Uh, I'm not here to tell you that I'm some visionary and I'm going to make this the future. I'm telling you this is the future. I might be able to participate in it. If I don't, it doesn't matter. It's going to happen anyway because other people are going to make it happen. Uh, I, I guarantee it. Uh, I do uh, 
I got to plug my article in this month's uh, Sky and Telescope, uh, which also talks about this topic. I talked about a lot of things for you guys that aren't in the article, uh, but there is um, there's an article about it in Sky and Tell this month as well. So be sure and, and check that out. And I think I've blabbed for almost a whole hour. Now we'll get into where does anybody want to fight? <laughs> uh, absolutely. Hi. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, can I? Can, Eric, can I go? Can I go first? Yeah, uh, sure, Andrew Klinger, 20 minutes ago, half an hour ago, um, posted a question up there, and uh, I suppose I should get back up to that question. It was about some of the other things that um, we now use uh, uh, dithering and uh, guiding for. In particular, he was talking about uh, getting rid of um, uh, a pattern noise and things like that. And I think what we're doing is we're holding on to our current way of thinking and trying to extrapolate it to what you're talking about. But um, if we get rid of guiding, don't we have to have something else to deal with pattern noise? And then later on, there were another series of questions. Okay, guiding is what tells me that a cloud has moved in. So what's going to tell me that a cloud has moved in? Uh, and um, there's some other you know questions like that that are kind of like analyzing the future that you're describing in terms of the present. Can you talk to that, please? Yes, yes. I was trying to find a slide. Um, I'll just start this back up again. I was trying to find a picture. I have this great picture from Byte Magazine. Um, oh, and, well. uh, yeah, Byte Magazine from like 30 years ago. And it shows uh, a computer watch. And the computer watch looks like a little tiny IBM computer and there's a little tiny floppy disk that they're putting in the watch. And that, I, I like to refer to that picture because it's like, when we think about the future, we think it has to, uh, we, it, we can only imagine the paradigm we're in today. We can't imagine the paradigm down the road. So first, um, when it comes to dithering, um, I always laugh because uh, I always dither. And uh, well, except when I'm live stacking. Um, uh, I always dither and I never guide. So all dithering is, is moving the mount. Um, the Sky X will dither without guiding. Uh, before the Sky X could dither without mounting, I, I wrote a script for the Sky X to dither uh, without guiding. All you have to do is bump the mount a little bit. You don't need to guide uh, to dither. And if you take an image with the guider and you go, oh, look, the clouds, why can't you do that with the main imager? The main imager can go, oh, look, there's a cloud this image is terrible. There must be a cloud. And so you can still take advantage of that. Pattern noise. There's two things about pattern noise. Number one, pattern noise is, um, is getting very, very small. It's not nearly as bad as it used to be. It's going to keep getting better. The second is you can still dither even with live stacking. Um, if you, uh, if you got, you could, uh, you, in fact, you could still guide to some degree. You, the comp no, never mind. Let's not go there. Um, but if you have a stack of five-minute images and then you move the mount and you stack five-minute images and then you move the mount and you stack five minutes worth of images, when you stack all of those, you can still do a statistical rejection and toss out, uh, you know, the the pixels, the, the hot pixels, and and so forth. So uh, the pattern noise and dithering. Um, Dithering does not need to go away. Uh, dithering is a very useful topic. Maybe when pattern noise is eventually gone, we won't need to dither. Um, it'll probably take a while. But there's no reason you can't dither without guiding. Uh, no does, the no Sky X, does the SkyX X2 driver support an external command to dither? Because I don't use it to, to take my images, and it has to know when the image is not, is not running. Yeah, there's there's two ways to uh, to go unguided in the sky. Just to give my old alma mater some some points here. One is there's two scripts that you can load. One is uh, unguided one shot color, and one is unguided um, mono. And they have variables at the top of the file. You don't have to be a script writer. You just change how many images you want, how much to dither, um, and um, the lRGB one you can actually set up. Um, which which filters to use and it will it will bump them out between each exposure and it'll wait just a little bit in case there's any movement 
Uh, it's a solid mount, but listen, when you put a big long refractor on there and you move it, it can it can bounce around a little bit. So you should like wait a uh, even when you're not guiding, wait, move the mount and then give it a minute to set, not a minute, but give it a few seconds to settle. Um, so two ways, in, oh, the second way in the sky is the LTI or the light imaging interface. When you set up a series in that, um, there's also a dither option and it will dither between each exposure. And even if, you're, if your filters are parfocal, uh, and you don't need to focus when you change filters and you're doing like a round robin, it won't even dither until you um, until you get back around to the same filter. Because if you take a red, a green, a blue, and a luminance, there's no reason to dither between those four exposures. Only when you get back around to the red do you need uh, do you need to do the, the dither. So all through your discussion, I kind of sense that without saying it, uh, there's a difference between how quickly we stop guiding and how long a focal length and how fast a scope we're working with. If we have a five meter scope that's an F10, we're going to be hanging on to guiding probably a little while longer than if we have a, you know, a, a 1,000 millimeter scope that's F3. Yes, that's absolutely and so true. So what's that's what's the crossover point, or do the people with the longer scope just have to wait a little bit? And the people with the shorter, faster scopes can do it right now. I would say, um, again, we're talking about the future. You know, I'm I'm looking into a crystal ball here. So, uh, I you know I've I've said things in talks that I gave five years ago that aren't true anymore. Uh, so I I could be wrong about what you know about down the road. But if you have five meters of focal length uh, and you're shooting at f10. Um, you're going to be hard pressed to go without guiding today, but either the cameras are going to get fast enough to uh, the cameras are going to get the next generation of cameras may enable you to do without that. Or you may find that the next generation of telescopes, you can have five meters of focal length. Well, eh, you, you can't get around the focal ratio. Five meters of focal length at F10. I mean, it's just going to be a really big scope. I would say you need to wait for the camera technology. So, I mean, right now, if you get a 20-inch plane wave F3.8, you've got a 4-meter scope. Oh, an F? Yeah. But an F, you're talking about F4. I would I would try going unguided with that now. No, I mean, the, I, I have a 20-inch plane wave that's 4 meters. That's uh, F7.8. So oh, okay. how quickly do I say, well, we're going to try these 30-second exposures live stacking or not what do you have the you have the 455 the yes. imx 455 um i can't guarantee anything but i would i would i would experiment now how long can you go unguided uh, the eccentricity starts to get a little bigger in your stars after three or four minutes five minutes for sure oh wow yeah but eric try eric, two minutes try two minutes i bet if you go two minutes you might you might get away with it eric could we go back about six or eight months when i think richard was here uh, but it may have been somebody else and uh, you were still <laughs> guiding everything and what what back about that time didn't you do something about that and start trying to, to not guide every now and then well, when I had the Hondas, I could do it. It was a fast scope. Okay. Uh, By the way, uh, uh, Richard, you're still sharing. And while I love Sky and Telescope, uh, I love your face too. So <laughs> you can come back. There you are, full life. Now whoever's talking should be getting priority there. Um, we had a lot of really good discussion out there. And I, I don't know if we covered all the questions. There were a lot of really competent astro imagers out there um you know i could just see by the names rolling by so oh that's interesting that these guys are here what tonight you guys come around more often here uh anyway um but a lot of the questions were being answered as we went along um is somebody uh, tim molly T terry uh, have you guys been reading the questions did we cover in one way or another all the questions that have been asked I, you know, I think we, we got them in a lot of people. We have 134 people on right I, now. I got I got and up to 153 at 722 or 1022, and, depending and on And there the are a lot of competent imagers that were supporting Richard's presentation and answering 
uh, and a few who weren't answering the questions in real time without guiding. Yeah, yeah and I think uh, kind of the 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 gist of a lot of questions that were asked were either addressed by Richard or uh, were asked by one of us. Mm -hmm. Um. You guys get your questions in. If you've got any more questions, please put them in there. But I have a question to ask Richard, particularly. Hey, Richard, you going for a ride? You going for a drive in the near future? And why? Uh, I'm going to the Grand Canyon Star Party. Why would anybody go to the Grand Canyon Star Party? <clears throat> well, lots. it's my third time being. It's my third time. It's one of my favorite events. It's actually different than um a lot of star parties that most amateur astronomers go to it's basically the world's largest outreach event so they clear out two of the bus parking lots and you set up your telescope a lot of people are doing visual uh, i've done live stacking every time i've been there and they bring in bus loads of people uh, the buses run till 11 o'clock and these are people who've never seen the Milky Way naked eye before, and they come over and they see a spiral galaxy on your screen. And so it's a really fun uh, way to share uh, astronomy with the general public on a really big uh, scale. Uh, even better, at 11 o'clock, the buses stop running, and you're um, at a dark sky park. They are international dark sky certified. The Milky Way is amazing there. It's like Bortle Zero. It's uh, it's just it's fantastic looking at the Milky Way with binoculars. The, the dust lanes are ghostly and magical and ethereal. Maybe it's the altitude, but it's just I've never seen anything like it. So it's a great dark sky site uh, site to do astrophotography, to do nightscapes. Um, some of my best Milky Way photos I've taken there. Um, but yeah, I'm going to do for a week. You're a volunteer ranger, you know, an interpretive ranger, uh, explaining the night sky to the general public. And then, you know, half the dark, half the park is after dark. Uh, you get the whole park, <laughs> your, you get the whole park to yourself, um, you know, after about 11 o'clock, uh, which is great. So, uh, some friends of mine, Kevin Lagarde from Skywatcher always goes, he's the one who actually got me to go originally. He's got a new 28 inch Dob that I'm anxious to uh, to play with. I do like visual too. And if you're going to do visual, a 28 inch knob is not a bad, uh, a bad way to do visual. Yeah. And I have to concur in everything you said about the, it, it is one of the world's all time great outreach events. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's also a pretty good start party, pretty dark skies and all that other stuff, but it's the outreach is just, Lots mm -hmm. and lots of people, lots of scopes and everything else. And that's why I wanted you to talk about it. We did get a question come in uh, from Brian Wilk while we were talking. Uh, Richard, do you have a chart that would help us give us imaging time with this shorter exposure suggestion compared to different scope speeds? Um, no. And, no. It, I, one thing I will say is it also depends on the target. Um, you know, some targets are brighter than others. Uh, it's like the whole, how many exposures do you need? If I'm shooting the Andromeda galaxy, you know, one exposure is often enough for the core. The core is very bright. It's very smooth. I got all the signal to noise ratio I need. And then as you get out to the arms, it, it starts to, you know, get darker and you need lots more time to, to collect more signal. Um, I, I, I don't like formulas because the, sometimes there's a ball game going on and the sky is brighter than it is another time. And sometimes there's more moisture in the air. And I always just take a few images. It's kind of like the rule of 500 when you're trying to shoot nightscapes. I'm like, what do you do that for? Why do you need a formula? Take an image. It's a good starting paint. Take an image, zoom in. If the stars are trailed, shorten the image. That's how long you need to shoot for. Um, I don't believe in microwave meals. Uh, it does the same thing for imaging. Uh, take some test shots and see what it looks like. Go as long as you can uh, for no reason other than to beat the duty cycle. And uh, so you don't, you, you can, you know, you have much rather stack 300 images than 800 images. So go as long as you can. Um, but I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't try 10 second exposures on a faint object right now at a slow focal ratio. Uh, it just, 
it, and again, it depends on it depends on the target that you're that you're shooting and sky conditions at the time. Maybe one day we'll have some charts for that, but I think we're going to get to the point to where we're not going to need the charts. You're just going to need to, you, you know, if you need to shoot for three hours, you shoot for three hours. I, th I think what people need to know about charts is that they're starting points, if anything, and yeah. use them as well as you can. But think about it when you're when you're imaging. Think about what you're doing and see if you need to do more or less as you go along. All the advice that is given out on cloudy nights on the Astro Imaging Channel and all these other places, it's just advice. We're not there with you and your rig. Go, go figure it out. Okay? Okay. Have we gotten all the questions? Yeah, I think so. I, 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 think, I think so. so. That means we got to say goodbye to Nostradamus here. Um, and uh, here, and that's mm -hmm. going to be the end of our show. And next uh, week Rich we... Pardon? Richard, you know to hang with us after the show ends. Okay. And uh, Francesco and postmortem. <laughs> well, where are we? <laughs> Francesco and Andrew and Philip and Peter are going to be with us next week to tell us about how they put together M106. They did a great job on that. And we'll be having more for you all summer. Uh, don't forget to push the old subscribe button. We would like to get more subscribers if we can. And be sure to come back and join us. We had a lot of people here tonight, probably because of Richard and because of the topic, the name of the topic. So uh, we need you. Come on back again next week. Great. Thanks, everybody. Thanks Good night. Tim, Bye. take us Good night, out. everyone. <laughs>